Life on the island, I, th I think, it is one of the real misconceptions that people have. Everybody always asks me, how does she survive? How does she get food? How does she do this? How does she do that? She's abandoned in her own town. Around 1800, something like two or 300 people were living on that island. So there was enough food. Yeah, everything's here. You don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. What you need to worry about, psychologically, how do you deal with being alone now? The Island of the Blue Dolphins is a book that I loved as a child. And going out to San Nicolas Island and being able to see the landscape, smell it, feel the wind on my face, knowing the aloneness, the solitude that she would have felt was extraordinarily intense. Now, I lived on this island my first two years at the park alone, so I can relate a little bit. I can imagine that over time, she just got accustomed to how to enjoy herself and provide for herself. I could really get a sense of what she must have gone through, although I could never possibly know. In a way, making that childhood dream come true just by being able to somewhat relive and then have such close physical contact with all of the archaeology that would have been very prevalent for her in her daily life. I'm sure after a number of years of being alone, you're going to realize that, that that's it, you're alone. They're not coming back for you. I don't think she thought she was going to be abandoned for 18 years. 18, that's a long, long time. It's kind of hard to comprehend what it would be like to be alone day after day after month after month, year after year. I mean, at some point, it's got to really play on your psyche. She could look to the east and think of hope and family. To the west, I wonder if there are times where she was desperate enough that she wished she could just get there you know, to the quiche heaven and just be done? Or did she remain strong that whole time? Fog crept in and out of the empty huts. It made shapes as it drifted and they reminded me of all the people who were dead and those who were gone. The noise of the surf seemed to be their voices speaking. In 1960, when the novel appeared, there weren't a lot of strong female characters in children's fiction. What do you think was the most dangerous thing that Karana experienced while she was on the island? One of the most dangerous things was the devilfish, the tsunami. I think the sea lion. Rantu is Karana's beloved dog and companion, but before he became that, he of course was the leader of the pack of wild dogs who roamed the island, terrifying Karana and her younger brother, and in fact, who most likely mortally wounded and ate her younger brother. There's also a pretty harrowing event for Karana when she's in the Cave of the Ancestors. Okay, what's the first thing you notice when you look into that cave? Uh, Nayan. Um, it's really dark and creepy. Looks dark and creepy. Raise your hand if you would not want to be in that cave at night. Myself included. You know, I really haven't put myself in her shoes, but I was moved by Cave of the Whales. It's kind of a, a spooky place. It's right at the edge of the ocean. You know, if I was the lone woman, I would have certainly known about this site. I would have felt the connection with the people who had painted those images, connection with the animal spirits that maybe they were depicting. That was a moving experience to be in the, the very back of that cave. Uh, it's a very sacred site. After a while, everyone assumes, well, she must have died by now. Why they make that assumption, I don't know. Maybe it's just a way of justifying not going back and, and getting her. In 1847, the uh, Boston Atlas, uh, I believe, was the first newspaper to report the story of the lone woman. There was never any real confirmation until you have uh, Captain Nidever spotting footprints on a beach. They'd come out and they'd see a whispery figure in the fog. They come back to the mainland. They tell the friars here at this mission that they found evidence of someone being on there. The friars encourage them to go back, and they do go back. In 1853, George Nidever, who was a frontiersman and hunter who came to, to California, put together a crew and took Carl Dittman and four mission Indians to do two things, to look for the lone woman and also to sea otter hunt. They were not on any sort of humanitarian uh, expedition to find people and return them. They figured, well, if there's an Indian here, there's an Indian. He lands at the island 
and the first thing he does is he looks for her. Carl walked along the shoreline and came around from behind. And as he looked down through the brush, he thought he saw a crow. There was this black object. As he came closer to that black object, it turned out to be the hair of the lone woman. During the whole narrative, they're all very concerned that she's going to run. He came very cautiously because he didn't know whether this would be the wild woman of San Nicolas Island or what it would be. So he came down from behind and presented himself, not knowing what to expect. Am I going to have a fight or what? But she smiled at him and went on her work. <laughs> You'd think it was a daily occurrence that somebody would drop in. According to Carl Dittman, the lone woman had matted hair, apparently sun bleached, and she was wearing a nearly full-length garment made out of sewn squares of bird skin, cormorant skin. Turns out they were never able to communicate with her. The mission Indians who are with Nidever can't communicate with her either. They had to use sign language and they got her to stay there and they hunted for about a month or so. I shook my head and smiled at him. He spoke again, slowly this time. And though his words sounded the same as before and meant nothing to me, they now seemed sweet. They were the sound of a human voice. There is no sound like this in all the world. 